So now in this next flowchart, we're going to continue our discussion on PCR. We left off with steps one and two complete, in which we did denaturation by heat, and we also did the annealing of the primer. So this next flowchart will be entitled PCR2, and we'll do the final step, which is step three. So PCR2 is going to be about step three, and it's also going to mention a little bit more about the primers that we um, established. So let's look at step three. Step three is entitled extension. Now that we have a primer on, now that we have denaturation and we have two separate strands, what do you think extension is going to be all about? Well, first of all, again, we have to always mention temperature. The temperature in this situation has sort of uh, been kicked up to about 72 degrees Celsius. This is interesting because this is going to be important for an enzyme. An enzyme that's used in an extension is really good. Remember, enzymes like very specific things. They're very picky. It's very good at hot temperatures of 72 degrees Celsius. That enzyme, and you should already know why we put the primers, it's because we need to utilize polymerase. Polymerase chain reaction. But we're not going to use any old polymerase. We're going to use a very special polymerase known as use TAC, T-A-Q, polymerase. This is a new enzyme to you guys, and I'll explain what it is right now. Use TAC polymerase to, and you guessed it, extend. Thus the name extension for step three, to extend, and that simply means to further replicate DNA. PCR is all about amplifying DNA, amplifying a known gene. We're going to use TAC polymerase and its ability to polymerize DNA and extend DNA very much so. So, what's the story with this guy? Who the heck is TAC? TAC is more commonly or less commonly referred to as thermos aquatux aqua I want to spell his name right or her name right aquatux okay what is this this is actually and here we go again our good friends bacteria that live in hot springs thus the name thermos aquatux hot springs water thermos meaning hot let's say um, so these guys live in hot water um, they are archaic bacteria. They are very, very old bacteria. But they are, interestingly, and I really can't believe, I just wonder how we figured this out. They're actually very stable at very high temperatures. Let's check the temperature. This is a pretty high temperature right here, 72 degrees Celsius. Not known for human life to possibly exist at that temperature. This is a very high temperature that this enzyme, this bacterial archaic enzyme, is very stable at. Thus, TAC polymerase, we can state it withstands. It has the strength. It has the ability as an important enzyme to withstand the temperature changes. Okay, It's very, very robust in terms of its ability to withstand temperature changes in the cycle. Because this is a, in, in the cycles of polymerase chain reaction. So when you wake up tomorrow or wake up today or right now, you have to think, TAC, this small enzyme, this very important enzyme, part of this bacteria that is able to polymerize at high temperatures, you are going to be using TAC polymerase, hopefully at least once within when you take Biolab here at Rutgers. Now, what does TAC polymerase actually do though? Okay, so what we're going to do and look at is the actual process of TAC polymerase. It actually begins the synthesis at, where do you think? What was step two about? Step two is about annealing. What did we need to anneal? Begin synthesis at primers. Primers were there because a polymerase always needs primers. TAC polymerase is no different than DNA polymerase in the sense that it needs primers. So we're going to synthesize at the primers that were annealed in step two. And over here, the synthesis, this synthesis is all about nucleotides being added to the primer by whom? By good old TAC polymerase, by good old TAC. And of course, TAC, just like every polymerase, follows the cardinal rule that he has to or she has to synthesize in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Again, prior knowledge being utilized here. This is going to create for us a new 
double-stranded DNA molecule, and thus we're going to have a molecule that is identical. Again, this is all about copying DNA, identical to our target region that we wanted, that we desired, so target region. We wanted this gene to be multiplied over and over and over again, so we're going to do that because this machine, this PCR machine, undergoes this polymerization process and this, these all three steps over many, many cycles. And you know how much DNA we end up with, even though we started with about, let's say, one DNA molecule? We end up with about a 10 to the 6th to about a 10 to the 9th, depending on the machine, depending on how much you want, fold increase. So we end up with so much more DNA than we possibly started with because of PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Please, please watch the YouTube playlist and look at your textbook images at this process. It's a very, very um, powerful process that is used every single day in almost every single biolab around the world. And we're going to conclude our PCR discussion by just briefly mentioning PCR primers and sort of elaborating on their role in this process. PCR primers are going to be important because we can actually utilize PCR primers for an important process that's going to allow us to clone um, much more efficiently than our bacterial cloning process. In the sense that PCR primers themselves sometimes actually include um, restriction sites. Okay, Remember restriction sites? They include restriction site at each end of let's say the DNA. So they include, uh, I don't know what that's doing there, include restriction site at each end of DNA. Well what does that mean? Basically what that entitles is that the fragment, okay, the fragment that actually matches, the fragment that matches our restriction site, um, let's say, is going to be somewhere in a cloning vector. We remember what a cloning vector is. Remember, that was just our bacterial plasmid, right? So we'll write that down as bacterial plasmid. So the fragment that matches, oh, I wrote that really poorly here, that matches the restriction site is actually, let's say, within the cloning vector. And what we're going to do is, with these PCR primer nonsense, is we're going to take the fragment that we want, okay, and we're going to combine it with the vector that we made. And this is going to both be cut with the same restriction enzyme one more time. This is going to cause these two things to hybridize, meaning mix together, and then we're going to ligate them, glue them together with what enzyme? With ligase. So this is yet, an, yet again another way to clone a desired gene. And end all be all is that we have plasmids from these, let's say, associations that we've created, let's say plasmids from these bacterial clones that we have made can be sequenced. And this is a great, great way for us to officially be able to select very much error-free clones. Okay. I think the best way to explain this PCR primer nonsense um, is to look at, and this is the first time I'm mentioning this, uh, I really want you to look at figure 20.9 in Campbell's biology. This will really help you understand PCR primers, as will all the other figures in chapter 20 entitled DNA Technology. Um, and that's it for PCR. And we'll conclude our lecture on DNA technology in the next video by looking at some applications of DNA technology in the real world.